Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this uh, town, Senior Health Town Hall. We are delighted to be jointly presenting this uh, with the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at UMass Boston in the uh, section of gerontology, um, as well as our senior health clinic here in the Division of Geriatrics at the Massachusetts General Hospital. I'm Dr. Matt Russell, the Clinical Director of Geriatrics at MGH and the Medical Director of our Senior Health Clinic. As many of you already know, uh, the goals of these town halls in the time of COVID are to provide you with the latest and most relevant evidence-based information, to continue to foster our sense of community throughout this, and to help us all maintain connections to our healthcare teams. Later on, I'll be speaking about that last part, but right now, I'd like to introduce our co-sponsor, Jim Hermelbrook. Thank you, Matt. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jim Hermelbrock. I am the director of the OLLI program at UMass Boston, and we are very um, glad that we can help sponsor um, these important informational meetings for older adults, adults on um, the COVID pandemic and virus. Just a little bit more about the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at UMass Boston. Like Matt said, we are part of the Gerontology Institute at UMass Boston, which really puts us into a unique position of serving older adults. Learning for the love of it. That is the mantra we seem to embrace with our members and our programs that we do. We offer academic and social programs for our members, most who live within the Boston area, but we also have those that live in the communities around Boston, especially on the South Shore. The majority of our members are ages 65 to 85, and they really enjoy taking part of the courses and programs that we are able to offer. Um, like most other um, organizations, we are virtual this um, semester, and we are happy to report we are offering over 50 courses to our members via Zoom, as well as over 30 one-time presentation and special events. And so um, that's a little bit more about OLLI, and I want to turn it now over to our moderator, um, Susan Eggman Leventon. Thank you, Jim. Um, I want to add my welcome to everyone else's. Um, you all, I hope you feel fully welcome to today's town hall, and we're so happy you could join us. Um, I'm the director of the MGH Stokel Center for Primary Care Innovation and want to share a few of our housekeeping rules before we get started. Um, first of all, everyone except for the speakers is muted to eliminate any background noise. Um, if you want to view the speaker on your full screen, um, you can go up to the upper right corner of the Zoom and you can see um, speaker view or gallery view. Gallery view will let you see all of the participants. And if you click on the speaker view, you'll see the person who's presenting. If your picture becomes jumpy or out of sync during the town hall, click stop video in the lower left corner. It looks like a little video camera. And that will help speed up your connection and improve um, the, the, the speaker view. If you have questions, and we really hope that you do, please use the chat feature, which is right in the middle across the bottom ribbon of your screen. Um, we ask you to not share any personal medical questions on the chat because everything you write in the chat or share can be seen by everyone that's in the town hall today. But if you do have a medical question, we really encourage you to reach out to your doctor directly. We also are going to ask you today, given what the, the nature of some of the presentations today, if you have resources or ideas about creative ways you are connecting safely with others or staying engaged in entertaining activities, um, please share those in the chat. I think that will be very helpful information for all of us to see. We're recording the town hall. And um, in a few days, it will be posted on the Senior Health Practice website, the MGH Division of Geriatrics and Palliative Care website. We also post it on the Stokel Center website, and you can also find it in the MGH YouTube channel, um, which will come up if you just Google MGH YouTube channel. 
Um, and please feel free to share these recordings with friends, family, anyone who you think might benefit from this information. Um, we are very grateful for all the excellent questions you sent, and we're going to do our best to answer them and anything else that you send us through the chat function. So with that, I want to introduce our speakers. Um, and in order, you will hear from Dr. Rochelle Walensky, who is the Chief of Infectious Disease at Mass General. And she's also been advising Governor Baker on COVID, and I'm sure many others have been on a national level. And then we're going to hear from Dr. Christine Ritchie, who is the Kenneth Meinecker Endowed Chair in Geriatric Medicine at Mass General. And then we'll hear from Dr. Matt Russell, who's the Clinical Director of Geriatrics and the Medical Director of Senior Health. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Walensky. Thank you so much. I'm so delighted to be here and to be chatting with you today. I thought I would um, break my comments into a few sections. One, a little bit about epidemiology and where we are in the country and in Massachusetts. Um, talk a bit about vaccines and where we are with that. And then um, how we transition from vaccines to life and what, what a, our life in the next few months to year, years might look like. So to tar start with epidemiology, um, when I think about epidemiology and I want to know sort of regionally how a a place in the country is doing. I look at two different metrics. One is the percent of um, positive tests that have been happening, um, which speaks both to how much disease is there, but also to how much testing is being done. Um, and early in our epidemic here in Massachusetts, in our surge, we had 20 to 25 percent of our tests being positive. Benchmarks that people have considered good are things less than 5%, less than 3%. And I'm pleased today to tell you that Massachusetts as a whole has a percent positive rate right now of 0.8%. It's an incredible success from where we were back in March or in April. Um, the next metric that I look like look at is the number of cases per hundred thousand and there's a general feeling that um, you're doing well if you're less than five cases per hundred thousand in general um, and so there are places around this country that are still at over a hundred cases per hundred thousand um, South Dakota some places in Texas and Florida and Alabama um, but we in Massachusetts um, are not there. I don't know what our overall case rate per, for the entire state is, but that has divided the state into different regions um, that is now available on the Massachusetts um, .gov website, the dph.gov website. Um, and so there are currently 17 um, towns in Massachusetts that are designated as red. And red in Massachusetts means that you are greater than eight cases per 100,000. Um, so there are towns such as Revere, Chelsea, Everett, um, Nantucket actually, that um, with the recent outbreak there, that have cases greater than eight per 100,000. They lie around 10, 15, 20 cases per 100,000. So not doing well by the Massachusetts standards per se, but actually doing quite a bit better than many of the other hot zones that we are thinking about across the country. So I just wanna put our red zones into the perspective of red zones in other places. But it is these benchmarks that we are using in many cases to think about whether it's safe to have school reopenings and whatnot. Um, as I think everybody knows, if you turn on any piece of the news, we're in the U.S. at about 6.6 .6 million total cases, and I fear over the week ahead that we are probably going to eclipse 200,000 deaths. Um, right now, we're at about 196,000 deaths. Um, still racking at about 1,000 deaths uh, per day, and I would consider these in incredibly tragic losses over the last seven months. So what is it that we are going to do about that? And, and what does the promise of a vaccine hold in the months ahead? So the first thing I wanna sort of let you know is that my favorite vaccine website is um, the New York Times vaccine, COVID vaccine tracker, which can really, um, if you Google that, it comes right up, it tells you the status of where things are, how many vaccines are in what stages of clinical trials, and what is the newest, what kinds of vaccines there are. So there are four vaccines I think that everybody is keeping their eye on that feel really closest to where we would like to be, to, to potentially being approved. Um, 
Two of those vaccines, we'll call them RNA or DNA vaccines, and then two of those vaccines are adenovirus vaccines, and they are viral vectors, but in fact, all of them have been replication depleted, which means they can't um, produce um, adenovirus within you. They're intended to be a, a conjugate so that the vaccine can work. Um, so I would say two are based in the RNA DNA space, two in the adenoviral vector space. Um, the important thing to realize about all four of them is we have never had a human vaccine with any of these approaches. So I say that just to temper what we think we can do with these vaccines over the short term, because I really want to make sure that it's well understood that this vaccination of the country, when we have one, if not more, vaccines is going to be a process and not an on-off switch. Um, and I think that that's really important to understand. Where we are with these clinical trials, for the most part, they are about 30,000 person clinical trials trials, and that number is brought to us because um, of the statistical analyses that have been done in order to understand vaccine efficacy. So it's not, it's, it's, um, not an accident, this number. It's statistically derived as to how big they have to be, projecting how many cases we expect, how many cases we expect in the placebo arm, what's going to happen over time. I also want to highlight that none of these four vaccines are enrolling children under 18. And very few of them are enrolling large numbers of people over 65. And so the reason that I mentioned that, there are, are some that are enrolling some subset of people over these age ranges, but the intent is large numbers of healthy volunteers to enroll people quickly so that they can get vaccine targets quickly. Now that will help us bring things um, closer to the population faster, but it also limits the generalizability of what we can take from these vaccine trials. Um, two of these vaccines, two of the four, have had some sort of slowing down in the process. So one of them has been the AstraZeneca, which I think people have heard about in the news. There was a neurologic complication in the UK. That trial has been stalled in terms of enrolling in the United States, although it is now re-enrolling in the UK, and we're not exactly sure if and when it will re start re-enrolling in the United States. The other is the Moderna trial, and that one has been not stopped but slowed down because there have been under-enrollment of minority populations, a lot of under-enrollment, so they've really wanted to make sure that they can enroll the minority populations to get this up and running. So we have some, some challenges associated with enrolling in these and, and moving forward with the expediency, which is a, a, just enough to say that I do think we need to be patient with regard to when these are going to come. In terms of the logistics of what happens when we get this wonderful EU uh, FDA emergency use authorization, what they're calling an FDA EUA, um, to approve one of these vaccines, the logistics of this, I think, cannot be discounted. So let me just be very clear as to what some of these logistical barriers are. Two of the vaccines need to be stored on dry ice. So scaling up the need for dry ice to massively vaccinate is really um, not a trivial exercise. So, so there's a lot of conversation about how we can keep the cold chain going if we need to massively vaccinate the entire population with a vaccine that requires it be held in dry ice. So that's one barrier that people are really thinking through. The second is that three of the four of these require um, and it's still not clear, but it looks like most of them are going to require um, two doses. And so when we think about what it takes to vaccinate the entire country uh, to the best of our ability for flu vaccination, now think about that twice because the efficacy of these is going to rely on the fact that not only do people get the first dose, but 21 to 28 days later, they also get the second dose. And then we layer on top the complexity of the fact that if there's one or two or three available vaccines, you actually need the second dose of the same one you got the first time. So there's logistical barriers of making sure that the chains are available, the, the supplies available for the same vaccine you got the first time. So ju this just, and, and many of us are working on how we're going to work through those logistics when they become available. Those are active conversations in 
and weekly calls, both at the state level, the national level, and at the MGB level of how we're going to handle these, um, these challenges when they are put upon us so that we are ready to go when we have vaccine. But in the meantime, because this is a process and not a switch, I think we all need to recognize that for us to get to what we believe is necessary, herd immunity, either by disease, but more likely by vaccine, we have some time ahead. Um, and so in that that context, I think, I do believe that face masks are going to be a part of our future. Um, my, my dinner conversation last night was with my high school junior to say, do you think I'm going to be wearing face masks at my prom? Um, and, and I said, yes. <laughs> um, so I don't think he was that happy to hear that. <laughs> but I do think that face masks are going to be with us for a couple of years at least ahead and maybe even longer. Um, I also want to sort of reiterate that there are many things that we can do now safely that we were not aware that would be safe back in March or April. And because we believe that the triple layer face masks keep us safe, especially when we are wearing them, others are wearing them, especially when we are outside and other things, I want to reiterate some of the things that we can do because I do not think the answer is staying home for the next year and a half. And so um, I want to sort of reiterate the importance of understanding your level of risk of disease and understanding your level of um, risk, or the level of risk of others who you may want to see and be with. So for example, um, you know, if you have been quarantining and your family has been quarantining and, and all you have done is gone out to the grocery store, as has your family and everybody's been wearing masks, you can probably have dinner together because you've been um, enjoying a very, very safe um, way of life, as has your family. Um, however, if your family is out and about, if there are um, teenagers around that are, um, you know, engaging with other teenagers and maybe or maybe not wearing masks, then that family may or may not be as safe as what you would envision and would like, and therefore you may want to be a little bit more careful. So what I want to sort of convey is that as we think about our pods of life, right, um, we have our own personal level of quarantine and then other people we may want to pod with. Let's just make sure that we're podding with people who have similar risk profiles as the ones that you've been engaging with. Um, and then finally, just a, a word about the flu, and that is um, my, my plug to get your flu shot. I want to just make sure folks really understand um, that flu for us in the hospital on any given year fills our ICU beds. Um, so that is not obvious to everyone. January and February in the hospital is really, we are borrowing beds from other services because of patients with influenza. Now that doesn't make it to the national news all the time, but what it, what it does do is say, we don't have a lot of give, even in a good flu season for COVID patients. So what we really need to do is, is prevent the disease we can prevent which is influenza through influenza vaccination. Interestingly, there are some theories out there ha that have looked at what's happening in the south. Um, in the south of the globe, there is not a ton of flu activity right now. Um, and in fact, people have hypothesized that we hopefully will not get a terrible flu season because what we're seeing in the south is not terrible. And in fact, people are not traveling. And in fact, people are wearing masks, all of which don't just prevent the coronavirus, but they also prevent the flu. All of that having been said, we don't know how it's going to impact us here, and I would really encourage you to get the flu vaccine. So with that, maybe I'll stop and I'll be happy to take questions later on. Let's go to Dr. Ritchie. Thank you. Thank Dr. you. Walensky. So greetings, everybody. It's uh, great to have this time with you. And I think uh, Dr. Walensky's talk sets you up well for this next uh, presentation, which is, okay, this may not be exactly what we thought. How do we keep going? So we're all dealing with uh, 
this virus, which we didn't even think much about, know much about prior to probably March or April of this year. And in March or April of this year, most of us thought that we were maybe on a shortish race, maybe four to six to eight laps. You know, if each lap is a month, uh, then we have, you know, six to eight months and then we'll be done with our race. But actually what we're experiencing is that we don't know where the finish line is and it certainly is not a lap. And so what that means is our coping strategies, the way we're going to move forward has to look differently than when we're in a situation where we know where the end is in sight. So, and the reason this is important is because we're learning now that there's fairly significant negative impacts of physical distancing, even though we know we need to do it. We know that this is contributing to social isolation. And some of you may have seen the uh, piece that came out in the Washington Post yesterday that showed how social isolation in and of itself is contributing to both morbidity and mortality for people with serious illnesses and especially those with dementia. We're seeing higher rates of depression, higher rates of anxiety, especially when uh, you have the TV on or you're looking on your phone to see what the latest news is telling you. Higher rates of chemical coping of all kinds of different substances, including alcohol. And with the social isolation, with these other issues sort of bubbling up, we're seeing higher rates of de cognitive decline and functional decline. So the question is, how do we keep this from happening to us? And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to ask you to put into the chat box some of your strategies that you're using to stay healthy and connected when life makes that harder. Because I'm guessing with 79 plus people on this call, on this town hall, that you, many of you have figured out some very important strategies for navigating what's going on to stay healthy. And in addition to that, we've also put together a number of different web links that we think may be helpful to you when you're thinking, thinking about how to stay sane in the middle of a race where we don't know where the end is. Monique, do you want to uh, share any of, or, or Susan, any of the chats that are coming up that tell us uh, how people are staying sane, healthy, and connected? Yes, it looks like many people are FaceTiming frequently with their family. People are doing Zoom yoga classes, um, taking the Ollie courses and walking. This is wonderful. Um, limiting television news, that's high on my list. Um, walking with friends with masks and FaceTiming with grandchildren and reading bedtime stories online is wonderful. Um, Zoom Qigong, which is, I think is fabulous. So um, someone is organizing a cross-cultural leadership course for refugees in high school. Wow. Um, taking a ride somewhere, talking on the telephone. Um, Zoom Ageless Grace, which is a program that is available at Mass General that we can put information about in the chat. Um, I think there are a lot of things, a lot of walking and spending time with friends and with grandchildren and limiting time in stores and participating in Zoom games. And I love this, rearranging my furniture at home. Um, I'm doing a lot of getting rid of things. So reconnecting with the former therapist, um, listening to music on YouTube before bed, keeping a routine, which I personally think is incredibly valuable. So I'm gonna stop there for now. Thank you, Susan. So I knew that you all would have some great ideas and strategies for all the rest of us. And so here are just a few, just to sort of get your, uh, your own sort of thinking going about maybe one thing that you're not doing right now that you might wanna do going forward. So first and foremost, and many of you talked about this, stay connected. This may require all kinds of strategies. Some of you talked about FaceTime, Skype, Zoom. There are many different ways to stay connected, even if it means just picking up the telephone, but working hard to stay connected. 
think about people you haven't actually talked to in a long time. They may really enjoy reconnecting with you. I reconnected recently with somebody I hadn't connected with in 10 years. It was so delightful. Think about people who you just like to see how they're doing or that you might be worried about and try connecting with them. What are some tips for staying connected? First, think about who your vital connections are. So who are those folks that you want to make sure they know about you and you know about them? This may include your doctor, it may include people who you've identified as your medical uh, or financial decision maker. It may include siblings, uh, dear friends, but think about those vital connections. Go ahead and write them down and think about how you want to stay connected with them. If you don't have their contact information, start going on a scavenger hunt to find it. This may sometimes mean actually Googling people and trying to find out if you can get their email address or through some other mechanism, a friend of a friend, that kind of thing. Get creative and try new ways to connect with others. I love some of the things that you all mentioned. Coming, coming up with a leadership class for uh, high school students, there are many ways we can actually engage with others through the phone or Zoom or some other connecting intervention. Think about what that might look like. Start a new hobby. Maybe you have always been in, uh, you know, working out in the, on your cars or um, outdoors. Try starting knitting if you haven't knit. There's actually some great tutorials on all kinds of things, uh, do-it-yourself do activities, knitting included, that you can find on websites. Think about an interest that you've had that you've always sort of put on the back burner and go ahead and sort of write it down and add it to your list. Think about those things that have, might have be on your bucket list. What might be ways that you could start creatively thinking about planning for them now, even if you can't do them now? And then think about healthy habits you might want to try that you haven't. Maybe you want to try a new way to get better sleep, a new way to have your um, diet improved. Write those down and add those to your list. And then if you are struggling, if you're struggling with depression, if you're struggling with issues around anxiety, if you're having challenges with chemical coping, there are a lot of resources out there and we put them into the chat uh, board for you to have available to you that we would encourage you to do, to reach out to. One of you mentioned uh, talking to a therapist. Make sure that you get help. It's very easy to start getting stuck and we would just encourage you to, to try to get over that hump and reach out and get help if you need it. Now, someone else also mentioned this, which is stay informed. And Dr. Walensky gave you some very good tips on ways to stay informed that are important, but, but probably not too uh, difficult uh, or anxiety producing, but not obsessed. So know when to turn off the TV, know when to stop all your digital activities, and know that when you do that, you can then move to things that will be more uh, you know, that will in, in, induce more serenity and perhaps also increase your overall well-being and quality of life. Step outside. Dr. Walensky also talked about ways that you can do that and how the value of mass enables you to even step outside with others. Get some fresh air. Those of you who are fortunate to live on the East Coast know that we are lucky that we're not on the West Coast and we actually can step outside and enjoy the beauty and generally positive air quality around us. And then finally, step into gratitude. This can take all kinds of forms. You can start a gratitude journal, start thinking about the things that you're grateful for. It might be your cup of coffee in the morning. It might be your extra cozy slippers. There are all kinds of things that you might not have thought about, but when you actually put it, put it, think about it, they're really things that you are grateful for. Think about people that you're grateful for and sit down and write them a letter. If there's anything that is particularly meaningful and enjoyable is to get a letter, a handwritten letter from another person, especially if it's a letter saying how much they appreciate you. And think about other ways that you can demonstrate gratitude to those in your life, either those close at hand 
maybe too close at hand because of your shelter together or those that are far away. So to sum up then, think about these four S's, staying uh, connected, staying up to date, but not too up to date with what's going around you, stepping outside and stepping into gratitude. And our hope is that with these activities, with some of the things that you've heard on chat and with some of the resources that we've given you on chat, that these will give you some ways to think about new approaches that you can write down and start doing today. And I'll stop there and turn it over to Matt. Great, thank you, Christine. These are wonderful ideas. I, um, I actually have a hobby where I book myself um, on, on Expedia or, or, or hotels.com for these exotic trips. I never take them, but it's just, <laughs> it's just a nice thing to be able to say, wow, what's Bali like? Let's live, I mean, if you're gonna dream, dream big. So um, my, my role right now, uh, after all these wonderful speakers, is really just to talk about how we can connect with healthcare so, and stay in connection with healthcare. I'll speak specifically to what goes on in our geriatrics ambulatory practice, which is called Senior Health. Um, and I would encourage those of you who have a primary care provider outside of that to check with your provider because they, while they're probably doing almost exactly what we're doing, it's important to just check and make sure that uh, I'm not giving you information that isn't correct. So the first thing I'd like to say is um, we do want to make sure that our patients especially stay in touch with their healthcare providers. We know in geriatrics that patients who have multiple chronic conditions really do need to have uh, frequent check-ins with their healthcare team to ensure that the chronic diseases are well maintained and not at risk for immediate decompensation. So for things like heart failure or diabetes or kidney disease, um, or even patients who are, are managing cancers or heart surgeries. These are complex patients that we need to stay in touch with. So from geriatrics, what we'll often do is proactive outreach just to make sure that you remain on our radar, that we remain on your radar, and that we're uh, agreeing on both the frequency and type of visits that we need to have. So as many of you know, uh, those of us who are blessed with technology can, can do something like Zoom. But for many people, they, they really don't like Zoom or they have computer challenges or they like to do telephone. So we have in-person visits, we have video visits, and we have telephone visits. Each one has a right indication and, and also limitations. So for those of us who are doing telephone calls, it's very challenging sometimes in a complex patient to get the whole story, to be able to see that person. And after a couple of months of COVID, we found that this is actually limiting our practice. Um, for those patients who have uh, the ability to do technology, the virtual visits are very helpful. And a lot of what we do as a team between the patient and the fam pa the patient, the family and the provider is we work on things like adjusting blood pressure medicines or diabetes medications. Many of us at home have blood pressure cuffs, are checking our finger sticks, are keeping logs. So it's a really good discussion and sometimes you don't have to come in. But in other instances, you do need to have that face-to-face -face rich encounter where you are both able to talk about a problem and sometimes see the problem. What is it like? That, what is my belly pain like? What is my chest pain like? These are times when we really need to see our patients. Now, early on in the COVID process, uh, sorry, COVID plague, um, we experienced people who didn't want to come in when they really needed to come in they were afraid because they didn't want to catch COVID, but we were afraid because they had something life-threatening other than COVID. I think we've figured that out a lot nowadays. And what we realize is this is a conversation where really it's about reassuring our patients and families about how we're going to keep them and ourselves safe. So we have been seeing patients in our clinic throughout the COVID pandemic. 
and we're seeing more and more. We're finding actually that many of our patients do want to come in in person and are having trouble because many of us were doing virtual visits. Now we're all sort of coming back to clinic, doing more in-person visits. What can you expect when you come to the office? Well, the first thing is you're going to get a phone call a day or two before asking you very basic screening questions to make sure that if there's a chance you might have COVID, we send you to the right screening place rather than bringing you into the clinic and potentially infecting other patients and staff. When you come to the clinic, you're going to actually go through a checkpoint where we ask you those questions again. You really are not using much of a waiting room. We're trying to take people directly into the rooms after their vitals are checked. The providers are generally wearing, well, they're not generally, they're wearing <laughs> face masks and eye protection, either as uh, goggles or as face shields. And that's on in-person visits. Everybody's washing their hands. You're gonna get a new mask and wash your hands as well when you come to our clinic. And we don't have people on top of each other coming into the clinic. We're staggering, so there is a decreased risk of transmission. Many people have asked about elevators and elevator etiquette. Um, I think it's reasonable to get in an elevator if it's not crowded. And if it is crowded, wait for the next one. Um, next, just getting on to the issue of flu shots and the timing of a flu shot. So patients over age 65 are encouraged to have the high dose flu vaccine. That's a, a well, it's in the name, it's a higher dose uh, than, the regular, than the regular vaccine. And it really it, it is for our patients who are older, as we age, our immune responses are a little more blunted. And so we wanna have that higher exposure. When do I get it? So Dr. Bhattacharya, who spoke at our last town hall, really did speak to the fact that getting the flu vaccine sooner rather than later is more important than the potential of waning immunity. So many of you have asked this question, well, it, will it still have the same effect later in the flu season? So the recommendation is that really by the end of October, all of us should have received the flu vaccine. Now, for those of us in healthcare, we all get vaccinated as part of the condition for working in, in the hospital. So we are all vaccinated and we have flu clinics. How do you get your flu vaccine? So at Senior Health, we will be having uh, an influenza clinic, I believe in later October. Um, we're going to do a, an email blast through uh, Patient Gateway to let folks know. But in the meantime, if you have an appointment with us in Senior Health, as part of your appointment, you'll receive the high dose flu vaccine in clinic. If you are not able to wait, if you don't have an appointment, these flu vaccines are offered at most pharmacies and you can get them. It's the same, it's the same vaccine that we give that they get in, at CVS or Walgreens or Rite Aid. What I would just say is make sure you specify that you are receiving the high dose vaccine, not the regular. So for people over age 65. Um, let's see, I think I've covered most of what I was hoping to cover again. Um, the parting message I would say is do not neglect your health in the midst of a pandemic. We want to keep people optimized for successful aging. And when people have multiple conditions that oftentimes require to keep a classic on the road, you have to do a frequent check-in. And it's really important that you continue to do that. Um, so I think that's all I have. And I guess we can go to back to Susan and see what the Q&A is. All right, thank you. Um, so I'm going to send the first questions to Dr. Walensky. Um, we have one about, are there any kind of air filters that might be helpful for indoor gatherings? And the second one that I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts about is how do we handle the holidays when we want to get together with people that actually haven't had a flu shot? Well, those are good questions. Okay, so the first one I'll start with air filters. Um, most major buildings or hospitals are equipped with MERV 13 filters um, or, or ventilator 
filters, and then the HEPA filters are the other ones that, that people will recognize. I want to sort of highlight a couple of things. One is, um, you know, there are very, first of all, I'm not a healthy buildings expert. I'm not an environmental scientist. I'm an infectious disease doc. So, so I feel like a little bit over my skis and giving advice on filters. <laughs> um, but those are the ones that I've read about that are really, really most helpful. The other thing I will say is the, the amount of transmission that occurs has a lot to do with how close you are to one another, whether both people are wearing masks or not, and then also the filtration of the building. So I think in the absence of really understanding what the filtration is, for example, in the grocery store, um, my suggestion is that if you and others are wearing a mask in the grocery store and you're not hanging out there for a long period of time, that you know you probably don't need to know that level of detail of the kind of filtration devices that are in your grocery stores because what you're wearing a mask and you're moving through that grocery store with some reasonable speed is probably going to be enough to to um to keep you safe so I, I think that that's really just important to recognize there have been outbreaks of places like um church choirs in Seattle. I think that was a really famous one that people were talking about. Um, and s air filtration and ventilation was really um, one of the things that was implicated there. And the reason I think that that one particularly was important is because A, it was in an evening in the church where they had turned off the ventilation in the church. B, they were not wearing masks. And C, they were singing, which was in close proximity and aerosolizing. So I think it was the combination of those events and not necessarily simply that the ventilation was turned off that led to um, the outbreak that occurred. Um, the second question was... Family members who oh. have not been, have not gotten the flu vaccine. You know, we're not quite in flu season yet. So I don't necessarily think that that um, is a challenge now. Um, and even for Thanksgiving, it may not be a challenge. As we get into Christmas, I would um, actually, uh, I would actually encourage you to have your family members vaccinated. I think all of us working together, that would be um, my biggest advice is not only will vaccination protect them, but it will protect you. And especially, um, uh, you know, you in fact may be more vulnerable than they might be. So to the extent that is possible, I know in Massachusetts, we have an, a mandatory flu vaccination for children going to school. Um, we are really trying to encourage seniors and I am really trying to encourage everyone to get a flu vaccine. All right, thank you. Um, I have one more question for you and this is perhaps the $64,000 question is why not universal testing and tracking? Yeah, it's a really great, really great question. Um, so there are a couple of reasons. Um, and I have been a massive advocate for more testing. I think that, in fact, if we could get a test that could work for COVID the way you check your sugar for diabetes, um, a point of care test that we could do every day in our home, that might even be more game changing and faster than a vaccine, quite honestly. Um, and I've been advocating for that a lot in the media as well. Um, the reason for the not, um, we're not doing it now is A, because we still, um, at seven, eight months into this, do not have enough tests in this country. Um, we do not have enough tests to, to test every American every day. And quite unfortunately with this disease, um, you know, your test can be negative today and it can be positive tomorrow. And so it gives you a sense of security for today and maybe one day with rapid antigen tests, we will be in a place that says, I got my test today, therefore I can go to the movies and or I could go to a restaurant, but it doesn't necessarily mean I got my test today, so tomorrow I can go for a restaurant, to a restaurant. So there's a volume issue, there's a supply issue, and then there's the fact that, you know, there's a bit of a false sense of security as to what a test today will tell you about how infectious you may or may not be tomorrow. Important to know that colleges are using this now a lot. Sev numerous universities and many in Boston are doing testing of their college students every three days or so um, in massive surveillance tests 
testing. I think it would be incredible if we could get country, the, the entire country to do this, but we just don't have the volume of the supply yet. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna um, send the next question to Dr. Ritchie because in the chat, we also heard that some people are using strategies like prayer and meditation. And I'm just wondering if you have any resources that you think are particularly helpful around meditation, prayer, contemplative thought, that sort of thing. Thank you for asking that question. And it is very important to take into account that there are many different ways to cope and stay uh, sane. And certainly prayer and meditation both have a strong and long history of uh, making a difference to people and making a difference to people in their lives. In the series of web links that uh, Monique posted in the chat, we have several that even include how to meditate. For some people, this is kind of a new phenomenon and it feels kind of like scary or off-putting or maybe complicated and it turns out it's not any of those things. And so uh, we'd love for you to, to try those out. Uh, there's, if you, if you Google, there's also something called the one minute uh, meditation, which for some of my colleagues and friends who uh, feel uh, afraid of, of the whole concept of meditation and mindfulness, find that to be useful. And, uh, and, and I, again, I think both, both from the standpoint of meditation and prayer, these can be extremely valuable strategies for uh, staying um, sane and, and for really flourishing and having more resilience in your life. Yeah, two, two actually that I'd like to add to that. One is an app called Calm, um, and another one that it, I think is really wonderful that comes out of the Spirit Rock Meditation Center in California is a program called 10% Happier um, that I strongly recommend that people take a look at. So um, we have one other question that I saw that is about plasma. And I think it's probably about the use of plasma for treatment. Um, so Dr. Walensky, do you wanna talk a little bit about that? Sure, so plasma has been in the news a lot. <laughs> um, and so let me tell you a little bit about plasma. So the thought is that um, we know that after you one would get COVID, that they develop antibodies to COVID around seven to 10 days. And that, that it is those protective antibodies that a person's body creates that allows them to help fight the virus and to control the virus for the most part. Um, so there's the study of plasma is that if we can take people who have had the disease, who have these antibodies, give them to people early in their disease course, maybe instead of waiting those seven to 10 days for their own body to make it, somebody else's antibodies could prove to be helpful to them and um, could then help them fight the disease faster and they could get well better. So that's sort of the concept. Um, the challenge is that there have not yet been published randomized controlled trials of plasma versus no plasma. And that's really our gold standard for when we use these things. I wanna reiterate that plasma has been used a lot for a lot of different diseases. It's generally pretty safe, but it's not 100% safe. There are transfusion related reactions. There have been several deaths associated with the transfusion of plasma, even in the context of COVID. So in that backdrop, there has been a massive study out of the Mayo Clinic and out of Hopkins that has looked at what happens when we give plasma to other people um, in, and I think it was 23,000 uh, patients. Um, the problem is it wasn't controlled. Now what they did find is that people who had got higher doses of plasma did better than people who got lower doses of plasma, but that's really not enough for our gold standard to generally approve something through the FDA or even to get an emergency use. What happened is, um, I will just tell you the facts and I will take the politics out of it, but it is the case that the night before the presidential, uh, the Republican National Convention, there was a um, FDA EUA that uh, 
approved the use of plasma in the absence of what many scientists would consider adequate data or the RCT. And that is why um, people have been anxious. Some have accused it as a political maneuver. Scientists have said that this is, they approved it without adequate data. I can tell you in the context of the FDA authorization, both the NIH and the, and the, ID, the Infectious Disease Society guidelines on the use of um, treatment, on, on treatment for COVID-19, have both declined to recommend plasma in, in the treatment of COVID-19 and suggested that people who wanted to use it do it in the context of a clinical trial. Thank you. Um, I have one more question for you, and that is something that, that um, we've gotten lots of questions about in the past, and that is, can you get COVID from touching surfaces? Um, right. So this is really, there have been a lot of studies that have talked about um, COVID coming up from flushing the toilet and COVID, you know, finding on my Amazon box and COVID, you know, on a metal surface. And so it is theoretically the case that you can get COVID in many of those different ways, as I just mentioned. What there haven't been, however, is really good transmission. So, so getting virus and being able to detect the virus from these surfaces, from the aerosolization when you flush a toilet and all of these different things is very, very different from having enough of a dose given to a person to actually result in disease. What I can tell you is, I suspect that if you had somebody who had like wiped his nose from full of COVID, touched your fork and then you, you know, ate, that it's definitely possible for you to get it with a large burden of virus on that fork. There have been very, very, there has been very, very little evidence that we can generally get it from surfaces. So that if somebody left a surface and then you came in and touched it again, that you would potentially get it. Um, so I, I want to say it's possible. I do very much believe in cleaning these surfaces and in hand washing and in pureling. But I will say in that context, when I hear about like schools closing for a deep clean for a full day, um, my answer is, maybe they should wear face masks. Okay, um, I, I actually have a question for you that's come up a lot recently in the press and that's about as we move into colder weather and it's not gonna be possible to have, to go to a restaurant and sit outside. Can you talk a little bit about the challenges of that? What kinds of precautions people should take and whether you should even go to a restaurant if the only place you can go is indoors? Yeah, so I'm relatively risk averse and I'm an infectious disease doc, so you have to take my bias and <laughs> there. But I will say that I have not returned to in per, in, inside dining. Okay. And so what I would say is um, put out the heater, sit in front of a fire outside, do what you can to to enjoy your time out eating outside for as much as you can in these um, moderate temperature months. Um, and uh, And then, you know, take in from your favorite place, sit across the dining room, a far dining room table, um, maybe open the windows and turn the fire on or something um, so that you can, you can do something that's a little, this is really where the winter is gonna get hard. Okay. Um, we did get a question about the importance or what is the impact of doing things like learning a new language for your cognition. And I'm gonna ask Dr. Ritchie to comment on that. Yes, so I, I also responded in the chat function, and that is to say that there are a number of studies, but not all studies, that suggest that learning a new language or learning new skills can have some protective effect with cognition. It's not 100% it's not though, so uh, I would encourage you to go learn a new language because I think it's a good thing to do and it's a good hobby and you'll get to meet new friends by doing it. That being said, we have much stronger evidence on the importance of exercise. So if you're really uh, interested in protecting your cognition, we have much stronger evidence on the importance of moderate to vigorous exercise, at least 150 minutes a week in um, reducing cognitive impairment and uh, also protecting against cognitive decline. All right, thank you. 
So I think we're almost out of time and I'm gonna turn this back over to Dr. Russell um, to leave us with some final thoughts. Oh, that's a tall task. <laughs> I've just really loved having our experts, uh, Dr. Walensky and Dr. Ritchie, speak to us about the infectious disease and, uh, considerations and also the considerations for positive aging in the midst of this. Uh, I'm not gonna use the word unprecedented because I'm sick of it and I think we all are, but in this weird time. <laughs> I think it's, uh, it's very important to remember that brains are like muscles and people are like neurons. If we're not in connection, we atrophy. And however we can form connection and use our muscles, the mental and the physical, that is really key to healthy affirmative aging in this unique time. And I'm sure our research in this area is going to demonstrate that moving forward. So uh, with that, Thank you all for making this a really wonderful exchange of information. The questions were fabulous. We look forward to doing this uh, soon. We haven't got our next date set up yet, do we, Susan? No. No, we don't. But we will. But we will. And uh, thank you to everybody for making this a wonderful experience. Stay healthy, stay well, have something pumpkin spicy. And I'm going to say a, a wonderful goodbye and, and actually a welcome to Judy Willett's mom, who joined oh. us from Detroit. So thank you so much for being with us today. Take care, everyone.